Hi everyone, it's great to be here presenting at CppCon. For a word about me, I'm a self-taught C++ developer. My areas of expertise are real-time rendering and game development. I host an educational YouTube channel dedicated to C++ and computer graphics. Currently, I'm a senior in the Warsaw Staszic High School. A paper I co-authored has been recently published at OSDA 22. If you'd like to know more, relevant links are here on the slide. Now let's get started with the talk. There have been many talks on performance and there are surely many to come. The goal of this talk is to aggregate the techniques I deemed most important into a single place and present them in an organized fashion. I won't tell you which ones are the best and which ones you should use. This decision can only be made based on performance tests. I will only show some possibilities along with their potential, potential pros and cons. The goal of this talk is to inform of as many opportunities as possible, rather than thoroughly discuss only a very narrow topic. What does it exactly mean for a program to be efficient? For this talk, I'll say that it requires a program to fulfill five criteria. The first one is don't do unnecessary work. It means that an efficient program should not waste time performing any computations which are redundant. One may wonder why would a program be made to do unnecessary work in the first place? The answer is by mistake. Well then, what are some concrete examples of unnecessary work? In this talk, we'll focus on the two probably most common in C++, unnecessary copying and unnecessary memory allocations. The second goal is using all available computing power. Although we won't talk about using GPUs or other accelerators, there is still a lot of power laying dormant in modern CPUs. We are past the days of a single core executing instructions in sequence. Modern CPUs are composed of multiple cores, each being a set of disparate execution units. Although work scheduling across these units is highly dependent on the concrete processor model, a compiler can leverage this knowledge if given a specific target microarchitecture. Additionally, we can manually use SIMD intrinsics to take advantage of special high-performance vector processing units. The third goal is avoiding unnecessary waits and stalls. Usually, a program consists of many computations which depend on one another in some way. When a program is parallelized to take advantage of multiple cores, often the performance gains are smaller than expected. This may be caused by the fact that the extent to which computations can actually be parallelized is limited by the dependencies between them. When a thread is dependent on a different thread, which hasn't completed its work yet, it has to wait, and useful time is lost. The amount of this time spent on waiting should be minimized. The most common solutions to this problem are using log-free data structures to send data between threads, using non-blocking asynchronous APIs, or using a job system. And the next goal is using hardware efficiently. Many of the performance improvements provided by new processor generations come from using complex speculative execution heuristics and multi-level caches. By taking advantage of them, program performance can be significantly increased. This mostly means writing cache-friendly and well-predictable code. The last goal is being efficient at the operating system level. Although C++ compiles to machine code, it is still the OS controlling the processor. This means that program execution is often interrupted and its threads can be migrated to other cores or suspended to give way to higher priority processes. By, by using OS-specific APIs, we can request that more hardware resources are allocated to our process. These are the goals I consider to be the most crucial to the performance of the vast majority of C++ programs. Now the question is, how do we achieve them? I'd say that there are three ways. The first one is effective use of language. By this, I mean using all features offered to us by the C++ grammar, like no except, const expert, or attributes. The second one is changing the build pipeline in some way. This includes using different compiler versions and standard, standard library implementations, as well as adding certain command line flags. The third one is optimizing by hand. This includes any changes made to the design or implementation done purely for the purpose of optimization. Now that we covered these main five goals and three courses of action, let's walk through some concrete examples of optimizations. I'd like to note that these are only optimization opportunities, so they may improve performance, but they also might not. 
As such, it's recommended to try them out in a development environment, like a new source call, like a new source control branch, and merge them with main code only after benchmarking and profiling and assessing actual performance differences. As this isn't a talk on measuring performance, I won't delve into the details, but do keep in mind that benchmarks come with their own various pitfalls. Although the examples are numbered on the slides, they are not presented in any significant order. The numbering only serves to make referring to them easier. The slide titles are written in imperative form, like orders, but that's only for conciseness. I strongly advise to avoid prematurely optimizing with no profiling. Let's start with those examples which don't require touching C++ code first, but build pipeline optimizations. The first thing to do is enable compiler optimizations. It's obvious, but has to be explicitly stated here for completeness. This can be done by, this can be done by adding relevant flags to the compiler driver invocation. An optimization opportunity here is to try out and compare, compare various flags, such as O2 or O3. It may be worth to spend some time researching the various flags available in your compiler. Some notable examples include setting the target architecture to enable the compiler to perform micro-optimizations addressed at specific micro-architectural details. It also tells it which SIMD instructions it can use. Another important flag is fast math. It depends on the compiler, but usually this flag enables additional optimizations regarding to floating point numbers at the expense of less precision or being non-standards non compliant. This can be useful in an application where speed is the top priority, while numerical accuracy is not, like game development and machine learning. Finally, some projects disable exceptions or RTTI to get rid of their overhead. I would like to note, though, that both exceptions and RTTI are an integral part of the language, so the decision to globally disable them in a codebase should be carefully thought through, especially that nowadays their overhead tends to be rather low. Another optimization step to consider enabling is the link time optimization. The idea behind it is that often the compiler has insufficient knowledge to properly optimize code at translation unit boundaries. As a refresher, a C++ program is made up of multiple translation units, each being a single C++ file with all its included headers. During building, the translation units are first compiled and assembled into, into corresponding object files, and only later, the object files are linked together to create a working executable. This means that the compiler might not be able to, for example, inline a call to a function from a different translation unit. On the other hand, the linker has the knowledge needed to perform these kinds of optimizations. And we can request that it does them by enabling LTO. Additionally to LTO, or as its substitute, you can also consider using Unity builds. It is a comp compilation technique which merges multiple source files into a single Uber so source file to produce only a few large translation units, which tells the compiler uh, which the compiler can better optimize. Unity builds also speed up compilation and linking by reducing the total number of source files. It's worth to say that enabling Unity builds is rarely as easy as enabling a switch, because a lot of code relies on macros, and these could be spilled between source files when combining them. Yet another step to consider is linking statically with your dependencies. This means using static libraries instead of shared libraries or DLLs. This provides more opportunities for optimizations at the call sites of their functions. An even better way is to use open source dependencies, whose use the compiler might be able to optimize even more, knowing their C or C++ source. To take into account, though, that linking statically creates a larger executable, as common library code cannot be shared between different programs. It may seem that it's not a problem. After all, memory sizes are counted in gigabytes, and machine code is rather compact. But the problem is that the processor's instruction cache capacity is still in the kilobytes. A different flag are profile-guided optimizations. The idea here is that actually, during building, the optimizers need to make a large number of guesses based on heuristics. One such guess might be if a given branch is taken often or not. An optimizer needs this knowledge to generate code friendly to the hardware branch predictor. So now, what if we didn't need to rely on heuristics to make these decisions, but use real-world data gathered from running our program? This is exactly what profile-guided optimizations are about. 
When used, they make building code a three-step process. First, the code is compiled with various performance counters embedded into it. Then, the program is run, producing a special file with profiling results. Finally, the program is built yet again, this time with profiling results given as an input. This new executable is specifically tuned according to the gathered data. The important thing here is that the program run used to gather profiling results needs to be representative of how the client is expected to use our program. It is also possible to perform multiple runs and, their, and then combine their results. Up next, we've got trying out different compilers. GCC, Clang, MSVC, ICC all output different binaries given the same source code. It's worth to try out compiling your project with different compilers and compare the output's performance. More sophisticated setups could even compile different translation units using different compilers and then use a compatible linker. You can also try using a different standard library implementation than the one supplied with your compiler. It could be potentially faster. Before starting to shuffle around compilers and standard libraries, you can always update your current compiler. Newer versions can feature smarter optimizations. On some systems, it is also possible to override standard library functions without having to relink a program. This is usually done by setting a special environmental variable. It is often used to speed up memory allocations by using a faster malloc implementation, such as TC malloc, JE malloc, or MI malloc. Finally, you can also use special binary post-processing tools, which attempt to optimize an already built application. An example of such a tool is LLVM Bolt. Its usage is similar to profile-guided optimization. A program has to be run with the Unix perf command to record profiling data. Then this data has to be converted to a format acceptable by Bolt. Finally, Bolt can be run to produce an optimized executable. Internally, this tool works by rearranging code layout within the binary based on control flow graph analysis and runtime profiling to better exploit hardware. Now we'll finally see some C++ code on the slides. Let's see what facilities does the language offer us and how to effectively use them. We'll begin with what I'd like to call annotations. This category of op optimizations is all about giving the compiler more knowledge without adding any evaluated code. Let's start with constexpr. For those unfamiliar with it, constexpr is one of these keywords which has multiple meanings. It can be used in three ways, all related to compile time code evaluation. It, its name comes from constant expressions, expressions whose values are known at compile time. Examples of such expressions are literals, simple arithmetic expressions, sizes and alignments of objects, and many more. The C++ standard doesn't explicitly say what is a constant expression. It says what is not a constant expression. The rules are becoming more liberal with each new C++ version. Constant expressions are nice because they mean that some of the computations that would have happened at runtime can be performed ahead of time during translation. To take advantage of them, we can mark functions or variables with the constexp keyword. Constexts per functions are functions which may result in a constant expression. It depends on the function body and the arguments if a specific invocation is a constant expression. There are many rules regarding which functions may be marked constexts per and which may not. Instead of reading through them, you can just try to mark a function as constexts per and see if the compiler complains. To see if a given invocation is evaluated at compile time, you can use std is constant evaluated. This magic function checks if the expression encompassing it is evaluated at compile time. Since C++23, if constevil can be used instead. Constevil is a different keyword also having multiple meanings. Apart from the already mentioned one, constevil can be used instead of constexpr when declaring a function. It makes the given function an immediate function. This means that this function can only be evaluated at compile time. The second use of constexpr is if constexpr. It is an if, st an if statement which must be executed at compile time. Hence, its condition must be a constant expression. Do note though that using std is constant evaluated in inside of it always yields true. That's because this function checks if its use is evaluated at compile time. Because constexpr if must always be evaluated at compile time, the function always yields true. That's why if constevil is preferable. Finally, constexpr can also be applied to variables. 
it does three things. Firstly, it requires the variable to be initialized at its declaration by a constant expression. Secondly, it implies that the variable is const. And finally, it makes each use of the variable a constant expression. Alternatively, a variable can be marked constinit. Constinit only requires the variable to be initialized by a constant expression. It is not const and its value can be freely modified at runtime. That's why its use is not a constant expression. Generally, constexpr, constinit, and constable are used to force the compiler to perform certain computations at compile time instead of doing them at runtime. Up next, we've got const. Basically, if you can't make a variable constexpr or constinit, see if you can make it const. Although compilers are often smart enough to notice that a variable's value never changes, it doesn't hurt to help it, just in case. Knowing that a variable is const allows the compiler to perform optimizations like hoisting. There are actually multiple ways to tell the compiler that a variable's value do doesn't change. Apart from declaring an object const, remember to mark member, fun uh, me member functions const if they don't mutate the object. Unfortunately, the compiler can't be certain if the member function really doesn't modify its state, as it's possible that it uses constcast. However, it doesn't hurt to be const correct. Since C++23, it is possible to use an alternate syntax to mark a function const. It's called an explicit object parameter declaration and works similarly to how methods work in Python or Rust. Another group of values which can be made const are global variables. Suppose you are maintaining a legacy graphics library. It operates like a huge state machine and stores all configuration and global variables. Putting aside all the design problems of such an API, let's, let's look at how one of its functions could look like. It draws a mesh by looping through all its primitives, and if they are front-facing, draws them in wireframe or field. Notice that the innermost branch depends on the global state. This is a well-predictable branch, but optimally, we'd like the compiler to host, hoist it out of the loop. Unfortunately, it cannot do that because it needs to be conservative and assume that the drawing functions could change the global state. Fortunately, this problem can easily be solved by storing the global variable in a local constant. Of course, this optimization only applies when the copy itself is cheap. Now let's talk about no accept. This specifier can be applied to a function to say that it will never throw exceptions. This is useful both as documentation for the user and as an optimization opportunity for the compiler. Exceptions do incur an overhead, so knowing that if a given function will never throw them allows the compiler to omit doing exception handling at the function's call sites. Just like with const, a compiler can often realize that a function never throws exceptions by itself, but it costs only eight characters to make the compiler be certain. No accept can also be made conditional. This is usually used in function templates where the no acceptness varies between instantiations and is dependent on the template parameters. To help with this, no accept also works as an operator, which says if a given expression is no accept. This is the so called no accept, no accept idiom. Before we move on, I will note that it is especially important to try to make move constructors and move assignment operators be no accept. That's because it's common practice to optimize generic code for that scenario. Up next, we've got static. Usually static is used to mark variables and functions so that they retain their values between invocations, or to mark member functions as not operating on a class instance. However, static, can, static also has a third use. It can be used to mark namespace code variables and functions as having internal linkage. What does that mean? Well, for simplicity, I'll assume we are living in a pre-modules world. Here, here, global variables and functions can have either internal linkage or external linkage. Names with internal linkage cannot be used from other translation units because they are invisible to the linker. On the other hand, names with external linkage can be used from other files. But how does that making but, by, but how does making a symbol have internal linkage improve performance? Well, let's look at an example. We have a function f1. It performs a bunch of random arithmetic, which doesn't really mean anything. All we care about is the machine code of f1 is so long that the compiler decide, decided not to inline it in main. 
That seems reasonable, except F1 is called only once. So it's it no matter how big it is, it's worth to be inlined. Okay then, maybe marking the function inline will help? Nope. The compiler still decides to call it. This is because nowadays inline is only a very weak hint to the optimizer and often has no effect. That's not to say that it's useless. On the contrary, it is useful in header-only libraries to avoid ODR violations. But it won't help us with performance. What about static? Well, apparently, it causes the function to be inlined. And if we think about that, this makes sense. Now the compiler knows that this function can only be used in the current source file. So it concludes that it is called only once and inlines it. Now let's talk about attributes. Attributes are a language feature introduced in C11 used to annotate code. Some of them are related to performance. Let's begin with no return. No return can be used to mark a function as never returning to its caller. This is usually used uh, for error reporting functions which either throw an exception or terminate the program. Knowing that a function never returns can allow the compiler to better optimize code at its call site. Another attribute is likely and its pair unlikely. These attributes apply to branches like if statements and switches. They are used to tell the compiler which branch we expect to be more likely, which helps it better optimize code for cache locality and for the branch predictor. Let's look at an example. We have a library. It has a function called internal work, which does some important stuff. However, before it can be called, the library needs to be initialized. We want to be kind to the user, so we make a wrapper, and instead of going full UB mode or throwing an exception, we simply initialize the library ourselves, because it isn't very expensive and is done only once. Still, we introduce a branch. Let's look at what exactly does the compiler do with our code. Well, it looks rather straightforward. First, the guard is compared with false. Uh, with false. And uh, if uh, we haven't initialized yet, we go to the uh, branching path. Uh, 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 no. And if we haven't, uh, if we have initialized already, then we go to the uh, path where work is done, and otherwise we first initialize the library. So now we know that initialization will, initialization will happen only once. So let's see what happens if we mark it as unlikely. And now... Let's see. Okay, that wasn't supposed to happen. Compiler Explorer, please work. Okay, so now in the uh, when our code was marked unlikely, we see that the code gen is indeed different. The branching path uh, does initialization, and the regular path goes straight to work. So uh, the attribute clearly did something. We'll get back to branch, branch prediction later in the talk, but for now I'll note that this is indeed faster. Now let's look at another attribute, assume. Assume will be standardized in C++23. However, for many years it has been available in most compilers as an extension, albeit with a different syntax. Assume is similar to an assert. It states that a given condition must be true. There are two differences between them. The first one is of intent. Assumes are meant for the optimizer, while asserts are meant to be read by programmers. The second difference is that asserts are verified in debug mode and removed in release mode, while assumes are never verified. Assumes are used to give the optimizer more knowledge. They can be used to say that a pointer argument is not null to remove redundant checks. Though in this case, better use a reference. They can be used to say that the pointer is aligned, so the compiler can generate aligned instructions. In this case, you can also use a, dedication, a dedicated function called std assume aligned. It can also be used to say that a piece of code is unreachable. The, though in this case, you can also use the C23 function std unreachable. There is also a different way to provide more information about pointers, and it is using restrict. Restrict isn't a part of C++, but a C99 inspired extension supported by most compilers. When applied to a pointer, it says that it does not alias anything. 
This means that there are no other pointers that refer to the same memory region. In the case of many restricted pointers, this usually means that each one points to a different array or data structure and that these arrays or structures don't overlap. This means that, specifically, one pointer may not point to a subregion of a different pointer's memory region. Of course, the, in the general case, that's rarely true, as pointers are constantly copied and passed between functions, but it is useful in small scopes. For example, it can be used to mark function arguments. This can allow the compiler to perform additional optimizations like vectorization. An example of such function is memcopy. Actually, if we manually write a memcopy function, adding restrict to it makes a big difference. Without restrict, the compiler does indeed generate, generate vectorized code, but it is quite a long implementation that has also a few branches. Meanwhile, when using restrict, the compiler simply directly call, calls the optimized standard library memcopy function. As a side note, all this additional assumed information about pointers is usually referred to as provenance. It is also possible to mark, res uh, mark restrict a pointer return from a function. This is usually done by making the function a malloc-like function, using a special attribute. Lastly, we've got pure functions. It's a different than standard annotation supported by some compilers. Pure functions are functions which work like mathematical functions. They have no side effects and their output depend, depends only on their parameters. Knowing this, the, the optimizer can, for example, hoist them out of loops. GCC-like compilers actually support two attributes, attributes, const and pure. Pure also allows functions to depend on global variables, while const strongly enforces that they use only their parameters. These aren't all the standard attributes and all compiler extensions, so I strongly encourage you to research the facilities offered by your compiler. I will also make it clear that if assumptions like pointer alignment or a function being pure are broken, then the program exhibits undefined behavior. Now that we are done with annotations, let's talk about some other language level optimizations, mainly how to avoid making unnecessary copies. Uh, one place uh, where unnecessary copies are often made are function boundaries. Let's say that we are discussing a parameter called x. I think that a rule of thumb algorithm for determining how to take parameters looks something like this. Firstly, if, we're taking, if we are writing a function template, we need to think if x should be perfectly forwarded. If not, or if we are not writing a template, let's first assume that x is not a range. It's not a, clock, a collection of values like an array, but a single value. If x can be null, empty, or in other words, if there might not be an x, instead of taking an x, take an optional of x. Regarding how should the optional be taken, that depends on the wrapped type. And using an optional is safer than taking a possibly null pointer. If x can't be null, do we need to have any ownership of it? If yes, then it's probably best to use a smart pointer or other, other handle type that automatically takes care of ownership. Basically, if we don't need to take a smart pointer to something, it's best not to take a smart pointer or something, as otherwise we would just be forcing the user to use a smart pointer, uh, to use our smart pointer type. Now, if we don't need ownership, do we still access value? If we do, then it's best to take it by an R value reference to signal that to the caller. So they need to explicitly use std move on an L value to call our function. If we don't move from it, do we copy it? If we do, then it's best to let the compiler handle the copying and take by value. This will actually allow temporaries to be moved into the argument with no redundant copies being made. Then, if we don't copy x but we, we modify its contents, we need to take it by an L value reference. Finally, otherwise we only read from x. This could mean taking it by a const reference but actually, in the case of small, often trivially copyable objects, it's actually better to ex take x by value. This can allow it to be passed to the function through registers, and it can also allow the compiler to perform optimizations based on the knowledge that the value of x doesn't change within the function. If it were taken by reference, it would be possible that the reference object is, let's say, a global variable, which is modified through an aliasing pointer or reference within the function. 
Now, if x is a range, then do we need it to represent a contiguous piece of storage, like an array? If we do, then we can take an std span. To take into account, though, that a span cannot be marked with restrict. Still, it is possible to extract the pointer from the span and mark that pointer as restrict. If x doesn't have to be contiguous, then can it be an arbitrary range? If yes, then in modern C++, uh, we can uh, make a function template accepting an appropriate concept from the range's namespace. If x cannot be an arbitrary range, does it need to be uh, a concrete container? If yes, then we need to take that container, but otherwise we can just take an iterator pair. Generally, if we don't need to take a container like a, be uh, like a vector, it's better to take a span, a range, or an iterator pair. Also, prefer taking string views by value to taking char pointers or string references. This avoids implicit conversions from C strings to C++ strings and vice versa, along with allocations associated with these conversions. To note though that a string view is read-only. So going back to the diagram, if X is a read-only string, then take a string view. You may have noticed that there are two cases missing. Namely, if x is an invocable, like a function, then firstly we should try to make its type a template argument and possibly use a concept. If, that's, if that cannot be done, if, uh, then try using a function pointer or a member function pointer. If that is enough, then that is the option that provides least overhead. Otherwise, we can also use the C++23 std move only function, which has less overhead than regular std function. There are also many third-party pre-C++23 implementations of it. One of it is in Boost. If that doesn't work, then you'll have to fall back to std function. The last case is if x is a memory address. If it is, if it does not represent an object or a range thereof, then we simply need to take a row pointer. This can be necessary, for example, when interfacing with C APIs. But don't take a pointer if you really don't need to, because there are a lot of different errors and bugs and undefined behaviors that can occur when using pointers unnecessarily. Leaving behind copying and function boundaries, allocations can also happen when constructing, when constructing objects. That's why it is important to avoid, avoid constructing constructing heap-allocated objects inside of loops. Often they are temporary variables. By hoisting they de their declarations out of a loop, their allocated memory uh, can be preserved between loop iterations. If the object needs to be in a clean state at the beginning of each iteration, it can be reset using a method like clear. Allocations can happen in loops even if no objects are declared in it. An example of this is adding elements to a container. If the upper bound on size is known, reserve can be called before a loop to allocate memory up front. Actually, this can even save memory in certain scenarios. After all, in the case of a vector, pushback has amortized constant time complexity only because each time the capacity grows by a factor like 1.5 or 2. This means that often vectors can allocate more space than actually required. A different copying pitfall is related to exception handling. It involves catching exceptions by value. Similarly to function pa uh, parameters, if we don't need to copy the exception object, capturing it by a reference can be more efficient. Additionally, it prevents slicing exceptions if their dynamic type is different from the cot type. Exception must be captured by reference if we want to modify the original exception instance. However, in that case, if we are going to rethrow the exception, it is better to do it using the rethrow syntax instead of rethrowing the captured reference. The compiler can better optimize and potentially save some copies. Other places where capturing by reference can improve performance are range-based for loops, lambda captures, and structured bindings. Finally, a different means of preventing copies is to implement are value qualified member functions. What are those? Well, often we implement two overloads for member functions, a regular one and a, and a const one. A regular one works on, uh, uh, on regular instances and const on those which cannot be modified. This is usually used when providing an accessor to some internal member of the class, like when making a wrapper like optional. In order to be const correct, the constness of the wrapping object must be preserved in the returned reference type. 
This doesn't take a special case into account, though, namely an R value. In this example, the Q object gets copied, despite the fact that the optional wrapping it is a temporary. This is because there isn't an overload returning an R value. To fix this issue, we have to provide a third overload. Now, this new overload will get called, and because it returns an R value, the Q will get moved. Note, though, that we need to explicitly std move the data when returning it. The downside of this is that now we have not two, but three copies of our, fun of our value function. Fortunately, proposal P0847 comes to the rescue once again, and using the C++23 explicit object parameter declaration, when we can deduplicate the overloads back to one, and we don't even need to explicitly remember about the R value overload. Now that we are done with the low-hanging fruit, it's time to get down to the bare metal and discover how the hardware running our code actually operates. The typical mental model of how memory works is that it is a tape. A long tape made of byte-sized cells which we can address using pointers. Is this model true? Well, this answer isn't as straightforward as it may seem. The two concepts crucial to under understanding modern memory systems are virtual memory and caches. At the highest level, from the point of view of the C++ standard, memory available to a program consists of one or more contiguous sequences of bytes. It isn't guaranteed that pointers allocated with subsequent calls to new, so to say, live in the same universe. Actually, subtracting them is undefined behavior. In practice, though, all memory available to a process lives in the same contiguous address space. The thing is that this large contiguous address space is an illusion created by the operating system. Memory as a whole does have a universal addressing. It is contiguous and the operating system would be able to loop through every single byte in sequence. Still, the virtual address space available to a process is scattered around in the actual physical space. That's mainly because on modern systems there are usually thousands of processes running simultaneously all competing for resources like memory. It would be incredibly hard to find a contiguous block of physical storage large enough to satisfy a process's needs. The smallest chunk of memory guaranteed to be contiguous in both address spaces is a page, and its typical size is 4 kilobytes. A page is contiguous because the mapping of virtual to physical memory occurs at a page size granularity. This mapping is stored in a page table, which itself is stored somewhere in kernel space memory under the control of the operating system. So, accessing memory is a three-step process. The program itself requests an address from its virtual address space. Then the processor translates this address to a physical address, and finally uses it to read the data from memory. Often the case is that memory is running low, and it is impossible to fit all pages of all processes in physical memory. Still, we don't want to crash any program. To solve this issue, when memory contention is high, some pages may be evicted from memory and written to persistent storage, like a hard drive or an SSD. The pages which are left in memory are called the working set. This means that if, if a program will want to access a page from outside its working set, the OS will need to first go through the slow process of fetching them from disk. This is called a page fault. But at least the program is not terminated, and even, if case of low, if, even in, in case of low memory av avail availability, all processes can continue to run. If page faults occur frequently, program performance suffers. This is called thrashing. To prevent it, when doing performance-critical work, a program should access a possibly small set of memory, hence the name, working set. This isn't the full picture of memory, though. Let's talk about caching. A fundamental problem of all modern memory is high latency. It requires multiple hundreds of CPU cycles to get a request, requested piece of data from memory, 
Unfortunately, there's really nothing we can do about this. There are physical limitations, such as speed of light, on how fast we can transfer data. As such, hardware engineers sidestepped the problem using two techniques, prefetching and caching. Prefetching takes advantage of high memory throughputs. When a processor requests a piece of data, RAM actually returns a whole chunk of memory adjacent to the requested memory location. This chunk is called a cache line. Although the latency of the initial access remains high, if subsequent accesses will be performed close in memory, then the CPU won't have to go all the way to RAM to perform them. This assumption that the program will use data which is close to in memory is called data locality. The second technique is caching. The principle is very simple. The processor won't have to go to RAM for memory if it'll have its own small memory inside. As the space on the CPU die is limited, the cache will necessarily have a small capacity. Because of this, only the most recently used data will be available in this small high-speed cache. This assumption that the program will, use re will reuse memory which it has accessed recently is called temporal locality. Actually, modern CPU caches have multiple levels. Usually there are three, called the L1 cache, the L2 cache, and the L3 cache. The L1 cache is often split into a separate L1 instruction cache for machine code and an L1 data cache for everything else. Some, in, some architectures with complex instruction decoding even feature caches for the decoded microcode. Like on x86, it is common to have a micro-op micro cache and even a loopback buffer for microcode from very tight uh, loops. There is also a dedicated cache for virtual to physical memory address translations called the Translation Leukocyte Buffer, or TLB for short. Its purpose is to avoid having to go to the page table in RAM every time when accessing virtual memory. Going back to the memory access diagram, the full picture look like, looks like this. When accessing a piece of memory, the processor first tries to get it from its local cache, and only if there is a cache miss does it fall back to main memory. What are the takeaways for optimization from this? Well, firstly, access memory sequentially to benefit from the hardware prefetcher and data locality. This mostly means using contiguous containers like arrays, vectors, or flat associative containers, while limiting the use of pointer-chasing based data structures like lists or tree-based associative containers. This also means iterating through containers like multidimensional arrays sequentially, in the order in which they are stored in memory, so in a row major order. Data locality can also be exploited by strategically reordering members of a class. Let's suppose that we are writing a class wrapping some C handle. It stores the opaque handle type, some information used for debugging, and a reference to a different related important object. The memory layout of this class will look like this. Let's think if this is optimal. Well, we know that the handle and the device will be used frequently, while the debug info will be used rarely, if ever. So there is no point in storing the debug info directly. Better use an indirection, like a unique pointer with a pool allocator. Meanwhile, let's store the device handle directly to avoid indirection when accessing it, and additionally have a reference to its wrapper to access other information about the device. Code which exploits data locality often also exploits temporal locality. Yet there are also some other ways to be temporally local. One is to set thread affinities. This basically means pinning a thread to a specific CPU core. Because the OS cannot migrate a thread, its L1 and L2 cache contents should be valid for longer. It is also possible to demand from the OS that our process has higher priority or that its specific thread has higher priority, which can also reduce context switches and thread migrations. I want to warn that using these APIs improperly can sev severely degrade performance of the entire operating system or even make it completely unresponsive. As such, it's best to start with designing optimal memory layouts and access patterns. Being cache-friendly is a very vast topic. I think that 
the most important topics worth exploring are contiguous data structures, data-oriented design, structures of arrays, entity component systems, and non-uniform memory access architectures. Cache isn't always on our side. An example of a cache-related pitfall is false sharing. False sharing is a false data dependency between threads caused by cache contention. It exists when two threads concurrently access the same cache line, but don't use it to communicate with each other. To avoid false sharing, data used by different threads should be kept apart in memory. The distance required to avoid the false sharing is given by the constant STD hardware destructive interference size. There is also an analogous constant which gives the constructive interference size. In practice, both are usually equal to the cache line size, usually 64 bytes. Finally, in some cases, we actually don't want to use the cache. This is very rare. However, sometimes we can want to copy a piece of memory to a different place in the address space, but we don't care about its contents and we know that they won't be accessed by the CPU in the near future. An example of this is interfacing with memory of an extended device, like a GPU. Different architectures use different instructions for this. Now let's talk about a different important component of modern CPUs, the branch predictor. The branch predictor is basically like a fortune teller. Modern CPUs are highly parallelized on the instruction level and try to execute multiple instructions in parallel and they often do it out of order. As such, it is important for them to be important to pred predict the results of branches. That's because otherwise, how could a processor start executing instructions out of order if it doesn't know which code path it is about to take. The branch predictor, as such, is an important piece of design of CPUs and should be exploited with uh, code to take advantage of it. The main example of being friendly to the branch predictor is to avoid indirected calls. What I mean by this is avoiding any virtual functions or function pointers or calls to dynamically shared libraries. This, is, does, this doesn't mean to use a program completely without them. However, in performance critical code, it is, it is um, prefer preferable to avoid them. It can be also uh, preferable to make branches predictable. This is a broad and hard topic, but Usually, it means that when, thinking, when designing an algorithm or thinking of how a program is about to operate, we should uh, think of uh, whether it, the branches in it are predictable. An example of this could be how uh, first and uh, simple uh, game engines worked, when there was uh, often a large array of uh, pointers to some uh, base class like game object and then there were a bunch of different subclasses inherited from this game object and then there was just a huge update loop that looped through the array and called the update function all on all of these members. So that's, that, would, uh, uh, that would be inefficient both to the instruction cache because we are constantly jumping to a different uh, place in our code and to predicting branches within those functions. So it would be best if those objects could be stored in different arrays or if we could sort the array, but of course without having to do an N log N sort because that also takes time of its own. A different opportunity is to use branchless optimizations, which basically means uh, removing branches from our code. Some of them are assembly level optimizations like using conditional moves, but much can be done in C++. For example, trying to do computation, which instead of doing a branch like an if statement, um, let's say multiplies a result by um, some constant. Compilers often make these optimizations by themselves, and uh, it, and the, in, the key thing to keep in mind about branchless optimizations here is that we are sacrificing um, 
branches for having to execute both code paths. Because if we make branchless code, then usually this means that we execute both branches at the same time and then use some arithmetic to choose one of their results. This is actually quite similar to how GPUs work with having warps of threads and threads within those warps that can often execute both parts of a branch and then only later uh, choose one of these branches because threads within a warp need to execute the same instructions. So it is always important to profile here. And uh, finally, we also have SIMD. If we look at a modern CPU die, or here in this case, we have a, a die of a Skylake client core, there is a, a, a lot of different things here. The execution unit itself isn't actually very large. A lot of uh, space is taken by other units such as the out of order execution unit or the branch prediction and all these caches. But a large uh, part of modern CPUs are uh, vector processing units, uh, which execute special SIMD instructions. And these SIMD instructions are dependent on the exact uh, target uh, uh, instruction set architecture, but basically they allow to process large amounts of data faster as long as we are executing the same uh, operations on them. So uh, as an example, I have written a, a simple, let's say, vectorizer, which tries to take a C++ source and convert it into intrinsics. Intrinsics are special built-in built -in functions, uh, sort of functions, because they actually translate to machine code, uh, which uh, uh, are used to use uh, SIMD instructions without having to write in assembly. So this tool uh, uses, in, internally uses Compiler Explorer to compile code to uh, assembly, and then converts those generated assembly instructions into the corresponding intrinsics. In this case, we are using Intel intrinsics for x86 and uh, uh, AVX512 intrinsics in uh, exactly. So here we have a function which takes uh, two uh, matrices, uh, four by four matrices of floats, and basically does a matrix multiply operation on them. This is uh, frequent in applications like computer graphics or machine learning. And uh, they are taken by a special type. This is the register type, which represents the SIMD uh, internal vector register. Uh, and this is the type that we use when operating with intrinsics. So we can see that if we use a smart compiler, in this case, this is GCC, actually uh, GCC is able to compile the C++ code to a bunch of optimized intrinsics uh, that run orders of magnitude faster than, uh, than non-vectorized code that would otherwise be uh, hand handwritten. So to conclude, in order for a program to be efficient, it's best to uh, you compile, compile your program with optimizations suitable for your uh, exact use case to remember to use all the features of C++ to annotate code, to, av to, uh, be, uh, to, to avoid making unnecessary copies by uh, looking for code, and to be uh, efficient for the hardware by, using, by either being cache-friendly, branch predictor-friendly, or manually vectorizing your code. Often also performing all these other optimizations in the presentation can help the compiler better vectorize the code automatically. So that's also a good plus for this. And as a recommendation that isn't uh, to do uh, an optimization to do for uh, code is to use uh, tools that actually can help you optimize code. I'd say that using a real-time tool like, let's say, uh, Clang Tidy running on a Clang D server, it's quite useful because it allows you to see different performance related warnings in real time while writing code. So you don't need, so 
a lot of these performance issues can be actually automatically caught and shown to you a second after you just writing, finish writing a function. And another important thing to consider is to try to implement uh, such uh, performance tests into a CI CD pipeline. For example, if we have an automatic contiguous integration server on which we uh, build our program each time a commit is pushed, it could be worth to export additionally, apart from, let's say, building the code and running unit tests, also run performance tests to make sure that there are no performance regressions. And because uh, those op compiler optimizations are so volatile, so uh, easy to break if there is a small bug in, in, in the code, I think it's worth to try using these tools to help uh, yourself as much as possible when writing, writing code. So finally, I'd like to uh, show the references used for the talk and everywhere else where credits where credits you. And this was your uh, performance to the list. So now let's go through some questions. So we have a question. Do you consider Unity builds a first class option for uh, C++ developers? Well, I'd say that yes, because for example, uh, CMake, which is a very commonly used build system, has Unity builds embedded into it. Also, uh, MSV, uh, MS build, Microsoft's uh, build system, also has Unity builds. So I'd say that especially when starting a new project, uh, Unity builds are definitely an option. Uh, it may be harder to implement them in a legacy code base because there a lot of code could rely on macros. But when starting new uh, things, new projects, I think that yes, they are a viable option. Okay, there is also a different uh, um, uh, question that compiler options like FastMath are very dangerous. Well, I agree that they are very dangerous. That's why at the beginning of the talk, I said that uh, all, the, all the things I present are only optimization opportunities and you should uh, try them out only after perf evaluating them. So yes, many of these things like using restrict or uh, setting process priorities are dangerous. I mean, if you run a very performance intensive program and set its priority to real time, you basically freeze the entire computer. So yes, uh, fast math is dangerous. It, it, it needs to be researched before you can use it. But in some places like games, people don't really care. And that's, that's why I also mentioned it. OK, uh, next question. Uh, why is it valuable to optimize with no return? Are, are those effectively the point of no return? So what is the value to optimize it? Uh, uh, if I understood the question correctly, um, it's the, it seems to be that uh, what are concrete examples of the optimizations that the compiler can perform based on knowing that a function is no return? Well, I can think of one example on the top from the top of my head. It's for example, if we have a function, if we have a no no return function, then uh, the compiler might be able to omit generating some uh, exception handling and stack unwinding code if uh, it knows that the function is no return because it knows that we are not going to return anyway so it can uh, remove uh, exception or it can move uh, exception handling from the cold uh, cold code to hot code because it knows that Returning is hot is called code. It's literally literally impossible. So I guess that that could be. Uh, so is it like a stronger no except? No, it, definitely not because no return is uh, is uh, very often used with functions that actually only throw exceptions. For example, there is a standard function called std throw with nested, which throws exception an exception. That has a nested that has the current exception nested within it. So in that case, uh, no return actually uh, means that. So no return is actually often quite a bit of opposite of no except because uh, 
very often, those functions which are no return are just exception throwing functions. Okay, so okay, so uh, what if the what if the x can be null or, or there is no x, but the original x, if present, doesn't live in an optional is and is expensive to copy? Is there something like an a non-owning optional view? Okay, so the uh, question here is, uh, so it's about the slide with uh, taking parameters to a function. Let's let me go back there. Okay, so. Uh, what if x can be null, okay, but uh, it is expensive to copy? Is there an, an non-owning optional view? Well, as far as I know, there isn't such a thing in the standard library, but you could always have an std optional of an std reference wrapper of the type of x. And in that case, you don't copy x. It's just... Uh, um, I think that could that that could solve this issue. Okay, uh, should we use likely and unlikely in practice? Uh, talk last year by Fedor Pikus mentioned that we humans are much worse guessers than compiler and bright predictors. Well, that's true that in a lot of cases uh, we are we are bad at guessing these kinds of things. Um, however, th that's why I didn't say to always use likely and unlikely uh, because. In, Likely and unlikely become nearly obsolete when you use profile-guided optimizations. Because in that case, uh, profile-guided optimizations are what drive these uh, heuristics that the compiler uses to see if a branch is taken off and off or not. So definitely, I'm not saying that you should literally use likely and unlikely everywhere in your code. No, I'm saying that it is possible to use them. It is good to be aware of their existence. And if you have a tight critical loop in an application and you have a branch there, and for some reason you cannot use profile-guided optimizations because that would be too costly. You would need to spend multiple hours on changing your entire build pipeline. Then I'd say using likely or unlikely is probably good for that code. Okay, so what is, there is a, also a related question. Uh, one example I recall from a tech that is some uh, okay that likely uh, okay some HFT firm is that they use likely for the actually unlikely case. Oh yes, yes, that's actually a, a, a good thing that was mentioned here. Yeah, likely and unlikely are named because they suggest they use they are use. They suggest that those things that happen like often should be marked likely. But that's true, as someone mentioned here in the chat, that in some applications, it, can, uh, it is actually better to mark the branch that is unlikely to be executed as likely. Let me explain why. Because likely means that the compiler considers this branch hot. It considers, considers it important. And it will optimize code for this path. So if we have, let's say, um, if we have a, an application such as audio processing or, um, no, maybe some, uh, uh, let's say we have a, a trading system, an, an algorithmic trading system, which has to process requests with, extreme la uh, with extremely low latencies. Well, requests come in infrequently, but uh, when they do come in, we want them to be processed as fast as possible. So, to, so in this case, yes, the path in which the request comes in should actually be marked as likely. Because then we, aren't, we don't really mean that the, this path is likely. We mean that uh, we want this path to be considered hot by the compiler and we want it to optimize for it. So when that code rarely happens, it is executed as fast as uh, possible. 